Hello, everybody, and thanks for coming to the second Intuitive Art Show. I'm Rachel Archelaus. This is Patty Adamick. Hi, thanks for having me today, Rachel. Yeah, and you know, Patty, I've known for a couple years now. We've talked uh, quite often, and every time we talk, I just am so fascinated by her knowledge and her connection with the consciousness of our bodies and our limp system and all that we can access through movement. And it's an area that I never really got into on my own. And so hearing Patty talk about it is just very inspiring and it's very opposite to how I think. I normally, when I think of like accessing consciousness, I normally think outwardly, you know, like, um, talking to my guides and they appear to be outside of me and going out to my higher self, which my energy extends out of my body. I rarely focus within. And I think that's why I'm so attracted to Patty's knowledge because she not only goes within, um, but she activates things through movement and she understands that like the cosmos live in our bodies, right? Like, we can access all that we can access outside of us within us. And it makes sense because if we think about the whole fractal idea that um, the microcosm is the macrocosm, right? Like every particle contained within the whole is contained within ourselves or, you know, everything is, you can break it down into smaller and smaller pieces and still have it be whole. I love that because she's really looking at the, the cell, right? Like the smallest pieces of us. And so today's going to be fascinating. Not to put any pressure on you, Patty, but... <laughs> <laughs> and she's going to make it easy to understand. So if there's any, ever anything that's kind of going over my head, I will make sure to ask for clarification for you who are, in, who are not here. You can't do that. And we're going to do some drawings today. So if you want to draw along, just grab your paper and your colors, whatever you color with. And we're going to do some fascinating drawings. One of them is going to be about asking our cells and our bodies what they need. And then we're going to come up with another one. <laughs> so we, we have a kind of idea of what we want to talk about here today, but we're open. So if you have any questions, type them in and we'll try to find them. I'm still getting used to blab. <laughs> And um, if you're on the replay and you want to get in touch with Patty, Patty, why don't you tell us how to do that right now? Uh, sure. You can visit my website, which is pattyadamick.com. It's P-A-T-T-Y-A-D-A-M-I-K.com. And there's a contact form, so you can send me an email uh, through that. Awesome. You can get in touch with me. Um at rachelarchelaus.com or intuitiveart.com. And um, thanks. We appreciate your conversation here. That's why we're on Blab. So if you also have something to, you want to say to us, you can get in on this open seat we've got. So just be here with us. And thanks. All right. So Patty. Um, you have like <laughs> too much history and credentials for me to summarize. So why don't you give us an idea of where this started for you and talk about um, continuum and w what we're going to talk about today. Like what got you into this? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> You know, I've always been very interested in movement. I have a background in dance and martial arts, and then for years was a massage therapist and body worker. So a lot of my clientele were people who were having difficulty moving in some way or another. So I've always been, I've always been interested in movement and how we move in different ways and how that connects us to our environment. Uh, I got into continuum movement in 2000 and it was something that was just presented to me by a friend of mine who had heard about it and there just happened to be a teacher coming to 
Houston to teach a weekend. And I just thought, hmm, this sounds interesting because I like to move and this is different. Well, I had no idea that it was going to kind of take over my life and change my worldview and uh, just really shift the way I work and the way I relate to people. Uh, continuum movement is based on the idea that for whatever reason, and we really don't know why, but uh, all living systems require water. We're mostly made of water. And water has its own organizing intelligence. And it's in constant circulation. If you think about the water on our planet, it's all been here since the atmosphere was formed billions of years ago. So the fluid that's inside of us right now could have been inside a dinosaur at some point. We don't, you know, we just don't know. And so to think of how- I'm gonna pause you there for a second because when you first told me that, I was like, whoa, that's incredible. You know, talk about a grounding force, right? Something that's been in the earth, above the earth, in our air, in dinosaurs, you know, in dinosaur poop, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's always been here. That's that's really, really cool. It's it is. It's really so this water, this fluid, I mean, if you think about it, water has until very recently, and still in indigenous cultures today, water is considered a sacred substance. You know, it's only recently in our society and modern culture that it's started to be thought of as a commodity. Mm -hmm. you know, people respected that it was the source of life. I don't know. There might be some religious or spiritual practice that doesn't use water, but I don't know of one, you know, from baptizing the ritual baths to cleansing ceremonies to pouring water into the earth. You know, all of them utilize water as a sacred substance. So when you start to think of, oh, wow, that's pretty important, you know, and we're anywhere from, depending on your, your makeup, your structure, you're anywhere from 50 to 75% water as an adult. Um, we start as 99% water as in, in the womb before we're born, as we're gestating as an embryo. We're, and the interesting thing about that is that this is another piece that isn't really thought about very often because we think of structures as containers. Like I've got this body that's holding all my pieces in. So you can think of it as a container with all these different structures. But in development, the movement is there first and the structure arises in order to support the movement. So the movement comes first. Um, I love that. And you know, that's um, that's true. I, I do a lot of work with business and small business owners. And so when you say that, that's what we do as well when we're developing something outside of us. Like, Mm -hmm. We think of our service or our expression first, and then we put the structure, the appropriate structure around it so that it can help support more growth. So that's really cool that that happens to us as well. So explain then like more about how we are 99% water then, and why do we lose so much water? Well, <laughs> We have, we solidify basically, you know, if you're, if a, um, an embryo in the womb is just, starts out as just a few cells and there's the organizing movement as the cells develop, as the cells reproduce, uh, as the blood is moving, the structures start to arise. And when we're born, you know, we're, we got, come into this particular gravitational uh, orientation. You know, a baby is in the womb, is in water, is in kind of a weightless environment. 
But in order to function on our planet, we have to be stabilized and coalesced to some extent. And, you know, if you look at a newborn baby, they don't know. They're like, whoa, you know, yeah. all over the place. And so as we grow and develop, we, we stabilize and the stabilization requires density, a certain density in order to just be here. Like if we grew up on Jupiter, we'd probably have very, very different, you know, we'd have these large gas cloud bodies or something, you know, so we're, we're particularly oriented to this gravitational field. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Does dehydration affect our consciousness? Could you talk about that at all? Are you? Oh, that's a really, that's a really juicy question. I love that. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I'd love to hear your take on that. Uh, as I drink my water, you know, <laughs> it, it's incredible how many people are constantly dehydrated. And if you're even slightly dehydrated, it affects the functioning of all your systems. So it's going to affect your brain. So it's going to be, it's going to affect your ability to think clearly. And that would also affect your consciousness. You wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have the same level of awareness when you're in a dehydrated state as when you're fully hydrated. Um, so definitely would affect your consciousness, your ability to even think clearly is affected. Mm -hmm. In fact, by the time you start to feel thirsty, you're already dehydrated. And a lot of people will, if they, they're chronically dehydrated, they'll just lose their sense of thirst. They won't even recognize that that's what it is. Mm. And this is particularly true as, as we age and also, you know, if people are on certain medications and that type of thing, it also will, um, will have an effect. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So don't be dehydrated. I honestly <laughs> take a sip of water right now. <laughs> it's really, in my experience, I find it to be, I've probably only been truly hydrated, maybe like for a couple year period in my life. And I, I only felt truly hydrated when I was eating um, completely raw and mm -hmm. drinking only spring water. And I can't say that that's going to be true for everyone, but I just noticed with myself and I live in the desert right now, so it's not a good um, time, but my fingers are like always pruny, almost always look like they're actually they look a little pretty good right now, but um, I just always am always, my skin's always dry. There's always something and I just never truly feel hydrated. Um, I'm not eating a hundred percent raw right now and I'm not, um, I'm drinking some water out of plastic, but it was amazing. The difference in feeling of like how I felt like, uh, consciousness, clarity of mind, energy level, that kind of thing. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, but getting back to inside the body. So we have this amazing water that is, the biggest part of us that's been around forever. So what does that mean? And what do you do with that knowledge? <laughs> well, you know, it is a mystery. As I said earlier, we don't really know what's up with this. But in terms of thinking about how to access information on different levels, if you recognize that this fluid that's an essential part of your being is universal. It's not just inside you, it's connected and it resonates with all other fluids in the, well, at least on the planet and in the galaxy and cosmos too, if you want to think that way. I mean, they're, they're starting to find that water is much more abundant in space than was ever even imagined. So that's kind of cool. Um, but I like to 
I like to talk in terms of body mind wisdom and I, uh, I very consciously say body mind instead of mind body, like talking about the mind body connection is, is really popular right now. And they're doing some amazing research about how your thoughts can affect your immune system and affect the functioning of your organs. But there's still a bias like that the mind is better than the body. Mm -hmm. And there's some sort of hierarchy, like you have to keep your your uh, mind engaged or this crazy body of yours is going to just uh, <laughs> I know, right? inappropriate, right? Like, like we're the ones you know, <laughs> creating all of these functions. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you think of body mind, it's like what is inside you that can inform you. They can give you the information that you need, whether it's something regarding your health, whether it's a decision you have to make, whether it's in relationship. Um, in continuum, we talk a lot about resonance and resonating with each other. And that's a fluid, those are the fluid systems resonating with each other, connecting. Mm -hmm. uh, so if someone's very compressed and very fearful or very shut down, they're not going to be able to connect with other people as easily. Mm -hmm. You know, let me ask you a question about this resonating thing and the whole body mind. It's when I remember the first time I drank green juice, it was, I was a nanny. I went to this um, whole foods in Norwalk, Connecticut and they had a juice bar. And so I got a green juice and when I drank it, it's like, I felt like my whole body lit up. I felt like the cells in my body were like rejoicing. It was that visceral. And, and I did like the taste. A lot of people don't at first, but that was, it had nothing to do with the taste. It was all body. Mm -hmm. Is that, could that be an example of resonating in my body? Uh, certainly. I mean, you, you, your system just, you gave it something it really, really desired, you know, and it responded very, very readily. Cause it's uh, not like it would have just been like, okay, now you're, you're all filled with nutrients. Cause I, I mean, I felt it on my skin. I felt it everywhere. It was a body recognition of something. It's not that it had now gone into my entire bloodstream and it was mm -hmm. you know, making new cells that it wouldn't happen that quickly. I don't think. Right. It was right. that like recognition of thank you for giving me what I need. <laughs> right. And you can feel that. I mean, that's why people get recharged and rejuvenated so much by being out in nature. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're away from, the electronics, you're away from the noise of cars and all of that sort of thing, and you're just in a natural setting, you know, your whole system starts to open up. Mm -hmm. um, because there's something about electronics and ele electromagnetic fields, and not just computers, but all of the electrical uh, things that we have around us, like the air conditioning and refrigerators and whatever, that that rhythm is much faster than a natural rhythm. And it ha and there's inside our system, what we're doing without realizing it is we're trying to match that rhythm. Mm -hmm. But it's not what our system as a natural living system is is wanting to do it's our it's a again it's our head it's our brain it's our culture whatever saying this is what we you know this is what we have to do this is the speed that is required mm -hmm. and it has this, it it shuts us down it it shuts down our perceptual abilities because we're you know if you you know how you feel if you've been working on the computer for a long time and you're you know your eyes are starting to cross and you don't even remember that there's things behind you or any anywhere else. Those are like that. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. I have so, to like force my shoulders back. I it's not a natural thing because I'm sitting here so much. 
Right. But compare that to how you feel when you're just, you know, taking a hike on a beautiful day somewhere yeah. and you notice the trees and you, you notice what's around you. You notice uh, how you're connecting, how your feet are connecting with the ground or how the breeze feels against your skin, that sort of thing. And often how deeply you can breathe. You know, when I'm, I turn into a shallow breather when I'm at my computer often, unless I remember to take deeper breaths. But mm -hmm. when you're outside, you're just naturally breathing correctly, normally, unless you're really stressed out and you're not letting yourself relax. You know, um, at Channel Panel last year, Wendy Kennedy was talking about this. And often when we talk about grounding, we think that it's to get back in our body, right? Because we're all spacey, floaty. But it's also about this. It's about entraining yourself to the frequency of the earth instead of the frequency of our technology. And it happens to me when I'm sitting here all day. Like if I go down to make some lunch, I'll want to multitask. I'll want to look at my phone. I'll want to scroll through things. It's that frequency that's kind of taken over that I'm entrained to. And I have to, it's a little scary sometimes. It's like, whoa, you know. I have to step back. I have to remember to become one with the earth again and not the, you know, plugged in stuff. And it's, it's weird. You can really start to feel the difference if you pay attention and you notice where your attention wants to go. If your attention wants to like keep going around in a circle and looking at pictures and watching videos and listening to things, mm -hmm. um, then you're probably not grounded in a, in a way that's going to be helpful for you. Do you find that as well? Most definitely. And, you know, it's something that I think is really, it needs to be recognized, especially with children. Mm. Because, okay, I'm almost 60 years old. I grew up before computers existed, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a cell phone when I was a kid. Cell phones didn't exist yet. <laughs> or, you know. So the pace and the rhythm of life was very different uh, than it is today. It, it really has accelerated. And some children never really have an unplugged moment, you know? Mm -hmm. and so they don't even know that they're ungrounded. Yeah. They have nothing to compare it to. I know. I, I don't know why it necessarily bothers me because, you know, I'm, I look at my phone and I scroll through things, but with the babies who, um, when they have a physical magazine in front of them, they try to scroll through it with their fingers because they don't know how to change. Oh. I know it's funny, but it's like, it's a little creepy as well, isn't it? It's like, gosh, what have we done? You know, I mean, a baby doesn't, know how to turn a page. I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with that because it's good to save paper. It's good to go out, you know, whatever. But um, it's just a little weird. And it does show what we're creating and where we're moving. So very interesting. All right. So back to our cells, you know, our cells can tell us so much. I think many of us who are spiritually awakening and acknowledging of that or are just beginning to come into it are noticing a lot of weird things happening with their bodies. I know that for me when I was, well, I've had weird things going on with my body my whole life, but more so all these like weird illnesses, weird symptoms coming up in, parallel to my consciousness shift. It can often be you know, what I'd like to call energetic in nature. And so the doctor's not going to find anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had people with like acute appendicitis symptoms go to the hospital and there's nothing wrong with their appendix, but mm -hmm. they're puking and, you know, it's real for them. So is there a way that we can talk to our bodies when these things are happening? Because is there a connection there beyond just the energetic that our, you know, our bodies can help us with? Well, I think so. Um, I know for myself, 
<clears throat> I have worked with cultivating what I call the language of sensation. So it can be really subtle. We feel this or we feel that. And, it, and if we're not paying attention, we won't even notice it. I think a lot of these kind of energetic illness type symptoms that come up are our body screaming at us because we haven't heard the the more subtle signals you know we've just sort of ignored them or weren't aware of them and so something big has to come up to get our attention uh i think that's a lot of it and i also it's a different ailments can point you toward things that you need to look at in other levels whether it's in relationships or emotional states or blind spots that you have about things the the ailments if you go inside of them and ask what what they're wanting to show you a lot of times you you can get a lot of information and solve a problem or have an insight and then the symptoms also diminish or go away completely. Mm -hmm. You know, I just looked up. It's we've been talking for half an hour already. Oh, doesn't it feel like five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> well, we better do something or we'll have like a seven hour show. <laughs> I know, well, I know I've got an interview at the top of the next hour, so I'll have to go um, <laughs> at the hour. But um this is a perfect segue because I know we were going to talk about um, what your drawing of your cells shared with you. And like you were just saying, you know, our bodies can really help us by showing us the cause of the issue that's not just physical, right? Like it can be a relationship. It can be uh, any number of things. The woman I talked about with needing the appendix, um, or so she thought out, it was all about her mom. And when she sat down and visioned with herself about that, um, she saw the image of her mom. She saw the old memories that she was kind of not wanting to deal with. And so it's true. Um, but there's a way we can do this with intuitive art. I think that you, I mean, that you came up with in your class that was brilliant. It's nothing I'd ever tried before. Well, it, yes, what we did um, in a continuum session, what we do is we start with some sort of inquiry, a curiosity, or it can be really specific, like a question, a really specific question. And then what we do is we use our sound to activate the fluid within us. We allow ourselves to move with that fluid and our movement is very different than it would be otherwise because it we will move the way water moves. So we move in spirals and what I like to call the movement of life. Um, life doesn't have a lot of, lot of straight lines. You know, if you look out at a tree, you see the swirls of the bark, you see the leaves rounded. It's, it's different. It's not like a house, mm -hmm. you know that has the straight lines and the square angles and all of that. So when we engage in that kind of movement, what we're really doing is we're merging our consciousness with the fluid intelligence of our planet. And so any information that's contained within that fluid intelligence then becomes accessible to us. Very cool. And what I love about the drawing, bringing the intuitive drawing into that is the drawing is really a great way to anchor that information because it's not usually verbal at first. It's it's an impression or a sensation or something is stirring, but it's hard to put words to it. And if you don't anchor it in some way, it can get lost really quickly. Yeah. So the drawing helps you. What we did is we, did our movement piece and then before we interacted with each other or talked or left the room or any of those types of things to take a break we did the drawing immediately while we were still in that state 
And what came out was just fascinating. It was, it was quite interesting. Um, so. Cool. Do you want to show us the hand movement? Yes, I yeah, I talk with my hands. <laughs> they move a lot. Okay. But I, I first of all, I would like to teach you a sound. Mm -hmm. This is one. This is like one of the continuum basic sounds, and it's really easy to do. And it is. It has the uh, capacity to open up space and to change the density of your tissue, so that you have more space internally as well as externally, it decompresses. That's, all right, repeat that, because that's amazing. Um, this sound, it's called the theta breath, is, and I actually have um, made a, a video about it a while back. I, on It's on YouTube if you want to. Yeah, we'll link to that in the show notes on intuitiveart.com. Okay, um, but the theta breath, what it does is it changes the density of our tissue. It decompresses. And when I was doing body work, and sometimes I do really deep trigger point work with people, and they would have pain uh, or they'd be hypersensitive to touch, and we would both do this theta breath, and it just it just eliminated all resistance in the tissue. Mm. So that that we could work really, really deeply and they wouldn't have any experience of pain and their body would just shift really quickly. So the theta breath is, it sounds like you're making a TH sound, except you don't quite do it. So it's sort of a hissing. Um, I'll just do it and then, yeah. yeah, it's very simple. So you keep your tongue behind your teeth. Sometimes you get little spit bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> so could you, I don't know if you could hear that okay. Or the first part of it. Can you do it one more time? Yeah. All right, let me try. Like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's like you're going to go, th but you don't go all that way. You keep your tongue inside behind your teeth. But you're, what happens when you're doing it, what happens is your lips are slightly parted so the air kind of comes out in this broad stream. And that's exactly the effect it has on your tissue is it opens and broadens and widens and, and decompresses it. Hmm. Interesting. So um, like in a continual practice, we would do a lot more sounds obviously, hmm. but then we would, allow the sound to move us. And I'm just going to use my hand because what movement arises is not what I call functional movement. It's the movement of life, it's intrinsic movement. So my hand is not trying to accomplish anything in this moment. Just like an intuitive art, right? Where our hand is just scribbling, it's just doing what it wants to do. Right, exactly. Now, and it's so different than say, you know, okay, I've got to pick up this glass. Mm -hmm. So you know, my fingers have to be in a very particular orientation. This is an exploration. So my fingers are just kind of, and you can do it with me, just kind of play around with the space. So thinking of how the space wants your fingers to move. So you let the space move you instead of you moving through space. And the smaller you make the movement, like just a little teeny tiny, the more interesting it becomes to your system because you don't know what's coming next. It is know? making me breathe differently. It, my posture changed, look at, my shoulders are back. So you think kind of deeper breaths. It's yeah, it's definitely having an effect on me. So do it even slower. See if you can really feel like the space is moving your fingers rather than your fingers moving through space.
So what, what are you noticing about that? It's almost like I'm trying to feel the resistance of the air, right? Mm -hmm. Like to move my hands. And I kind of feel like I'm a, an astronaut in space, like doing backflips, you know, in the, the fuselage or whatever. It's interesting. Yeah. I can feel the little muscles in my hand as well, which I don't normally pay attention to. Ben says, I feel it activate my hand chakras. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very cool. So do you, uh, since we've done this activation with our hand, do you want to do a drawing and see what our hand wants to tell us about this process? Absolutely. Okay, let's do that. All right, so what does my hand want to tell me about this process? Um, is that a clear enough question or do you want it to? Why don't we, why don't we ask something that, can we flip it into something that I think most people would really benefit from? Like they would benefit from this obviously, but people I know they want to know what their bodies want from them. You know, like a lot of people just don't know how, how to get out of their symptoms. Can, mm -hmm. we, can we ask something like that, even if we do the hand thing again? Of course. How about if we just ask, what is it that my cells want me to know? That's perfect. For my health. Awesome. The benefit of my health. What do my cells need me to know? Okay. So I'm going to, for all of those of you watching, I'm just going to pause the recording while we draw so you don't have to look at our top of our heads. And I'll start right back up. So you can pause this video right now if you're on the replay. All right. So. So let me just say, because you did stop the recording, that what we did before we started drawing was we did some more of those theta breaths and then the hand movement and then went into the drawing. So. Perfect. Do you want to share? Um, sure. This is, this is my drawing. And um, the, I think the first, I've got to put my glasses on because I can't tell what color. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, the first part that I have here, which has a lot of sharpness to it and also kind of tangled, um, is black, which for me represents uh, anger. And it's over top of the brown. And brown is my grounding compassion color. So I'm letting some of my groundedness and my compassion be um, be dissipated by being angry about something. And the anger is not beneficial to my cells. So the cells are like, get over it, really. <laughs> and this blue is my authenticity and healing color. So it's just letting me know that the more I stay authentic and focus on my own healing, then uh, the more potential I'll have because white for me is the void or the space of pure potential. And I just, there's a lot of white space up above. Mm. So, and I think I picked up that brown a couple of times. I think I laid it in and then picked it up a second time, so. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I know if you were to do a follow-up drawing, you could ask, you know, how to heal the anger or what's the anger about? Right. Mm -hmm. I have some ideas about what it's about. Yeah, well, I know you've also been looking into that for a while, so this isn't new information for Patty. Um, but I'm not either, honestly, but. Um, so. Mine is 
um, orange and green. This is like yellow. And then there's a lot of white that goes here. You can kind of see it. And orange is my mental color. It means thinking and strategizing. This is my expression color. This is a joy color. And then this is my truth. And um, so I don't know if it's saying to, if, if thinking is like restricting my expression. So if I'm censoring myself in some way or, um, or if my cells are just saying, you know, follow your joy, live in your truth and be expressed, you know, like express yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but it only, but it does kind of look like there's like a lasso or something constricting in my expression. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. What about you? Yeah. So the more that you just let yourself express your truth, the happier your cells are going to be. Mm -hmm. Well, I would attest to that. Yes. Yeah, so. um, yeah. And I would say for me, you know, the more that I stay in my authentic self, that's where the healing will come from. Mm -hmm. Whatever needs to be healed. You know, I think that even though this is a really simple thing, right? Be your authentic self and your, your cells will be happy. We often do the opposite. We often think that keeping ourselves as good little boys and girls or good employees or, you know, or good little savers or whatever we're doing mm -hmm. that's out of alignment, that's out of authenticity. We're, we think we're doing that to keep ourselves safe, right? And healthier, but really it's the opposite. That's true. We have to be expressed. We have to be authentic in order for ourselves to truly be happy. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. I actually, I was re um, watching this gardening video yesterday. I'm really into gardening. And this quote was perfect for the show. So I wrote it down. It's from this woman named Dr. Jana Bogues. She is uh, like a, a horticulturalist, but more, she's really into soil testing, plant testing to produce um, healthier soils that have a greater nutritional quantity for the plants. So her plants are like, you know, two to 70 times more nutritious than wow. USDA averages. Um, but she said this, she says, if it doesn't have the nutrients it needs, it can't display its full genetic potential. Hmm. And I thought that was so true for us too. Like if we are not giving ourselves the correct nutrients, whether it be love or uh, acceptance or vitamins and minerals or water, um, we can't express our true potential either. And so in food, it comes out as, you know, the, the food it doesn't taste as good as it possibly could. It's not yielding as much as it could. You know, it's not resistant to bugs and disease. But for us, right, it's the same. Like our health is compromised, um, but our output, our impact in the world is also compromised. Our happiness is compromised. So I thought that was a great parallel there between plants and us. <laughs> right. That's so true. And uh, there's so much going on now with genetics research and people get... Uh, worry because they have a genetic predisposition to this or that or whatever. But what they're saying is that it's not really the, the genetics only. That's just a, a tendency. It's the environment that determines whether that gene will be activated or not. Absolutely. Yeah. Epigenetics. Mm -hmm. I love epigenetics. Um, Dr. Bruce Lipton is a, a good resource for that if you want to look into it. And he writes in a way that everyone can understand, which is also good. Yeah. So that's, um, and just like there, you know, we're, we're learning that our thoughts can influence our physical functions. We also recognize that our physical functions play a big role in 
what kinds of thoughts even come into our head in the first place. Exactly. Yes. Well, Patty, I know I could talk to you for another zillion hours, but we got to wrap up. Um, is there anything else you want to leave us with? I know. I mean, I know you could also talk just for hours, but on the term of like, you know, the consciousness of our bodies and how to tap into that wisdom. Well, I have a saying, I used to have it as my tagline on, and I got a new email server, so I didn't put it back on, but I, I need to do that because movement equals thought. If you just think in those terms, movement equals thought. So when you move in new ways, you're going to think in new ways as well. And you can't get new results unless you create new thinking. That's, that's right. So if you feel stuck, you can, instead of just, <laughs> you can go like this instead and see what pops into your head and it might be completely unexpected. Beautiful. So anybody, if anybody has any last minute questions for Patty, you can um, type them in. All right. So once again, how can we reach you? What do you have going on right now? Are you promoting anything that you want to let us know about? Uh, sure. I actually, <clears throat> speaking of thinking new thoughts and moving in new ways and being in nature, I am going to be facilitating a major eco tour in Mexico that's going to combine continuum, intuitive drawing, being in a completely natural setting off the grid, no electromagnetic pollution, no light pollution. I mean, it's just this beautiful, pristine area where we'll spend a week. It's in April, April 17th to the 24th. And if you visit my website, pattyadamick.com, there is information about that retreat. And I also have some upcoming classes in Houston of continual movement and intuitive drawing. So you can check it out. And you can also go and take permaculture classes and uh, learn more about plants. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> looking into there's a wonderful permaculture center not too mm -hmm. far from, from town. That, that Yes. And it's interesting because in permaculture, the edges are so important. And plants really like to stay near the edges of borders of things. Um, so I think that's a little lesson about being willing to to live on the edge a little bit ourselves as well. God, I love this conversation. <laughs> um, you'll have to come back and we'll talk more about plants and, um, and movement. Maybe you can show us some bigger movement next time and show us more sounds. I would definitely go to that retreat with you, but my best friend's getting married on the 17th of April. Um, but maybe next time. And I hope all of you check it out. Her last name is spelled A-D-A-M-I-K. And it's Patty with a Y. Patty with a Y. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Follow us on Twitter if you're on Blab right now. Just I think click above our heads and you can we'll, we'll uh, notify you of any new shows that we have. I'm going to be on Blab every Tuesday with new interesting edgy conversations and intuitive art. If you want to learn intuitive art for free, you can go to intuitiveartacademy.com for a free class. And if you just want to check out the replays of the shows and my notes and blog posts and upcoming classes, go to intuitiveart.com. So thanks for watching. Thanks for being here with us, everybody. Thank you, Patty. This has been really fun. It has been fun. Thanks so much for inviting me, Rachel. You're welcome. All right, I'll talk to you very soon. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.